streaming only on Peacock. Ghislaine Maxwell had it all until she met Jeffrey Epstein. Ghislaine Maxwell's charged with enticement of minors, sex trafficking of children, and perjury. Epstein's Shadow, Ghislaine Maxwell, streaming now, only on Peacock. Hello and welcome to episode 253 of the UK True Crime Podcast. I'm Adam. Sorry I'm a day late this week, but it's been one of those somewhat challenging times we all face sometimes. I'm sure you know what I mean. Thanks for joining me for today's story, which is a return to our theme of the disparity between perception and reality. It's still not too late to bag your ticket for CrimeCon next weekend. I'll be there for the whole weekend. But despite that, it should be a lot of fun. Please use the code UKTC to get your discounted ticket, plus your invitation to my special podcast recording for only 20 people at the event. Plus, you can even be part of my true crime team for the quiz on Saturday night. Hey, you can even buy me a beer. The episode this week is sponsored by Best Fiends. A bit like spending time with me. When you play Best Fiends, the fun never ends. I play Best Fiends a lot, and it's never dull. There are always new levels, events, challenges. The game never gets boring, it never gets stale. I really enjoy the puzzles, and I know you would too, if you haven't played yet. And although the game is made for adults, I know that you're going to enjoy the bright, colourful gameplay. And of course, all the cute characters that you collect during the course of the game. I play on my own sometimes, but also with friends and family all over the country. It always gets competitive. You know how it is, right? The other great thing with Best Fiends is that you don't need internet connection, which is ideal for me living in a remote area where the internet is always a challenge. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Before we begin, a huge thank you to all my supporters on Patreon but especially the new members of this exclusive club. That is Rebecca Wadsworth and Stephen Bailey. Thank you both so much. Okay, let's set the context for today's story with the guest of the month and year game, the game that is about as much fun as a government COVID evening press conference. I found you from Axwell Top the UK Charts. In the US, it was Sean Kingston with Beautiful Girls. And in the Australian album chart, The top spot was taken by Fergie with Big Girls Don't Cry. In the news this month, the hashtag was invented and first used in a tweet by US product designer Chris Messina. I pondered whether to use the following fact as I thought it might make it too easy. But hey, let's risk it and go as a biscuit. This was the year that the University Campus Suffolk was established. Got it? And finally, in true crime news, 11-year-old Rhys Jones was shot dead in Croxteth in Liverpool. His death was believed to have been a random shooting carried out by a local gang. Did you get the month and year? It was August 2007. Today's story comes from the West Yorkshire town of Dewsbury, situated between the home of world football, Leeds, and a small town nearby. Hmm, I'm not too familiar with this place. um, Bradford, Bradford, got it between Leeds and Bradford. Its proximity to these major urban centres, as well as the excellent access provided to the M1 and M62 motorways, have in part contributed to the town's growth. Like most towns, Dewsbury is not unfamiliar to trials and tribulations, and was named a troubled town in 2005 after a barrage of negative press reports. Perhaps the most high profile of these reports came in the form of Mohammed Sadiq Khan the ringleader of that group responsible for the dreadful 7-7 London bombings. It was subsequently discovered that Khan lived in Lee's home, Dewsbury. Then in 2008, who can forget the case of Shannon Matthews, which also placed the town on the wrong side of comment. Shannon, a nine-year-old girl at the time from Dewsbury's Moorside estate, was reported missing, and a 24-day hunt was conducted before she was found hidden in a flat. Her own mum and two family acquaintances were eventually found guilty of the abduction and false imprisonment of the girl. They'd hoped, astonishingly, to claim their reward money on offer by finding Shannon and thereby miraculously solving her disappearance. A current overview of the town's present relationship with crime does not make 
for particularly happy reading either. It's the second most dangerous town in West Yorkshire and among the top most dangerous overall of the region's 121 villages, towns and cities. Of course, crime statistics can only tell us so much and they're notoriously troublesome in trying to portray patterns of crime. Are all crimes reported, for example, or what do police constitute as a crime? There isn't always a general consensus about what may count as criminal activity. And as such, it's important to approach such figures with scepticism and caution. Governments have to rely on the available data and information to inform their policy making in relation to crime policing and their probation and prison services. One area that I talk about a lot and draws a lot of attention is Britain's prisons and what should be done with those inside them. Are there better ways or perhaps more cost-effective things which could be done with prisoners? Uh, Yes. Or how long should they serve for particular crimes? All of these issues were brought very much into the glare of public scrutiny in 2007, following the story we'll be discussing today. Amanda Murphy was 47 years old. The mum of two was a former English literature teacher living in Unity Court, Dewsbury. The area is a standard, pleasant residential area, which looks much the same as any other that you may pass on a daily basis. The beige brickwork and gated gardens, they appear innocuous enough, but inside the property, things were not always quite so pleasant. That theme again of perception versus reality, which we talk about just so much on this podcast. Living with Amanda was her partner, Andrew Morian. He was, frankly, a deeply unpleasant man, with a face that even a mum would struggle to love. He was 36 years old with a foul temper and a string of past convictions, particularly relating to violent offences against women. In 2005, he'd served a 12-month sentence and was given an ASBO for attacking a former girlfriend with a beer bottle. He'd served four other jail terms before this, which surely demonstrates that he wasn't just a stupid violent thug, but also he showed a lack of remorse and certainly a lack of any rehabilitation. Mornian often drank to excess and was known to be a regular drug user. He and Amanda had lived at Unity Court only a short time, but during the 10 months the pair spent living there, he didn't make the shortlist for Neighbour of the Year. Neighbours heard frequent arguing and they witnessed several very public and very heated rows. Police were called to the address five times in this 10-month period. It was difficult for Amanda. Even prior to her relationship with Mornian, things had not always been easy for her. She was very vulnerable and she'd been let down by a number of other partners in the past. She really wanted it to work this time with Andrew. In June 2007, Mornian was convicted of assaulting Amanda and also of committing criminal damage. He was given a 12-month supervision order, which you may not be surprised to hear he didn't adhere to. The following day, he once again attacked Amanda in their home. Consequently, he was ordered to serve 20 weeks behind bars. Yep, 20 weeks. As Mornian served his sentence, unbeknown to him, he would shortly be granted a stroke of fortune that he certainly didn't deserve. At this time, UK jails were filling up rapidly. Prisoner numbers in England and Wales had reached 81,000 in 2007, so the Labour government at the time sought various methods in which they could tackle the issue of prison overcrowding, one of which was an early release scheme. The early release scheme would not be available to all prisoners, however, with anyone convicted of serious violence or sexual offences being totally excluded from it. That Mornian was eligible for it, considering his less than spotless copybook, appears a, at best, questionable decision. So it was then that the respite that Amanda had enjoyed from Mornian's controlling and aggressive behaviour was to be shortened earlier, as he was released in August 2007 under the end of custody licence scheme. In the end, he was released 18 days early, and under the government's scheme, offenders released early after a sentence of less than 12 months were not risk assessed by the probation service. Furthermore, and crucially, the address to which the offender returned was not checked. 
This meant that Andrew Mornian was at complete liberty to simply leave prison and return straight back to Amanda's house in Dewsbury. This aspect of the scheme did come under interrogation when it was first announced, not least by the Assistant General Secretary of the National Association of Probation Officers, Harry Fletcher. He warned the government of the possible risks in allowing prisoners to return to properties without suitable checks having taken place, saying, We pointed out to ministers that men with a history of violence against their partners were being let out without proper checks. The scheme needs to be urgently revised to ensure that anyone convicted of violence against their partner is not automatically returned to the same address. This common sense approach proved to be too late for Amanda Murphy. Only five days after his release from prison, Mornian's vile temper raged to the surface once more, with Amanda positioned disastrously in the firing line. On the evening of 18th of August 2007, Mornian again unleashed a merciless attack on his partner, beating her relentlessly about the head with his fists. The increased violence he used on this occasion was catastrophic. Amanda suffered awful head injuries, internal bleeding and fractures to her face and her ribs. After the brutal attack was over, Mornian coolly dialed the emergency services, telling them that his partner had fallen down the stairs and he'd simply found her lying there at the bottom. When paramedics arrived at the scene, they were confronted by a picture of utter horror. Amanda's injuries had rendered her unrecognisable, even to her own mum, Elaine, who visited her in hospital. Amanda bravely fought for her life for four further days after the attack, but it was a fight she could not win. And tragically, she died as a result of the injuries she'd sustained leaving behind her two sons, Luke and Matthew, as well as the rest of her grieving family and friends. Mornian's rather pathetic protestations that she'd fallen down the stairs in an accident were of course viewed with contempt and scorn. Amanda's injuries were such that there was no mistaking how she'd befallen them. Coupled with Mornian's previous record of persistent violent offences, this was certainly not one of West Yorkshire Police's more difficult cases to crack. The lead detective stated that Amanda was a vulnerable individual who was subjected to repeated and constant abuse by Morney and saying, He had a history of domestic violence against partners and he took advantage of Amanda's vulnerability. When police arrested Morney for the attack, he admitted to them that he'd repeatedly smashed her around the head after he reckoned that he'd discovered she'd been sleeping with his brother whilst he'd been in prison. On Wednesday the 10th of October, Amanda was laid to rest in a funeral service held at the Parkwood Crematorium, where her parents, Danny and Elaine, stood in grief with their usual great dignity as they mourned the loss of their daughter. In stark contrast to that dignity, in December 2007, Andrew Mornian was in a familiar situation a one he had faced many times before, as again he was before the courts, this time at Leeds Crown Court, in front of Senior High Court Judge Mrs Justice Swift. I think we can safely assume that Mornian's appearance before a female judge would have perturbed him. For once he would be on the receiving end, a female in control of his destiny, something he surely would have despised. Mornian had little option but to plead guilty to the murder of Amanda, he was sentenced to life and ordered he serve a minimum tariff of 14 years in jail. Interestingly though, the judge intimated she didn't believe that the early release had led to Amanda's death, saying that she believed he would have carried out the attack whenever he was released. Highlighting another pertinent issue, if this was the case, should Mornian ever be eligible for release? The judge's opinion was not a view shared by everyone, however. The case immediately triggered demands for the government to scrap its early release policy. Nick Herbert, the Tory Shadow Justice Secretary in 2007, left little doubt in his mind as to why Amanda had lost her life, saying, Amanda Mornian killed Amanda Murphy when he should have been in prison. He was released early as part of a disastrous scheme to relieve prison overcrowding. We argued that this scheme put members of the public at risk and should be scrapped immediately 
This has now been tragically demonstrated. These sentiments were echoed by Norman Brennan of the Victims of Crime Trust. He said that Mornian was simply a ticking time bomb who should still have been behind bars when he carried out the fatal attack. The case of Amanda was then catapulted into public view as it became the focus of a House of Commons debate the week following Mornian's sentencing. In an uncomfortable exchange with the then Secretary of State Jack Straw, his Conservative counterpart Nick Herbert asked, What does the Secretary of State have to say to Miss Murphy's relatives about the government's decision to release such offenders early? Jack Straw's reply was perhaps a predictable one, as he still aimed to defend the early release scheme, saying, This was a shameful murder, and as with any murder, our heart goes out to the relatives and friends of the victim. But I hope that since the Honourable Gentleman wishes to make something of this terrible incident, that he will take note of what the judge said in her sentencing remarks, which was she did not believe that the defendant's early release had led to Miss Murphy's death. The case became something of a point-scoring exercise between the two parties, with Nick Herbert reminding the House that one of the principal duties of the Secretary of State was to ensure public safety. It was his belief, simply, that Amanda's murderer ought to have been behind bars at the time he killed Amanda. But this was not the case, as the government had failed to provide enough prison places and had released Mornion on the streets before the end of his sentence and without risk assessment. Although the roots of the government's scheme were well-intentioned to relieve the pressure on Britain's prisons, but the strain was only transferred elsewhere, i.e. the probation service, who were then at capacity themselves in trying to monitor those on early release. In a somewhat bizarre yet equally as tragic subplot, Andrew Mornian would, while serving his sentence for Amanda's murder, be subjected to exactly what he had put Amanda Murphy's family through when his sister, Sarah Mornian, was murdered. Living in Birkby, a suburb close to Dewsbury, 32-year-old Sarah was a sex worker and lived a generally chaotic lifestyle, who, like her brother Andrew, had also discovered Class A drugs. As we've seen so often on this podcast, from this point, the once bubbly character and loving mum to her five-year-old boy appeared to change as she rather lost her way in life. On the evening of 17th of September 2007, literally only weeks after her brother had murdered Amanda Murphy in their home, Sarah Mornian was in a house in Birkby. The house was rented by Kevin Newton and his estranged wife Mary Golder. With Mary out that evening, Kevin and Sarah were alone in the property. At some point, Newton murdered Sarah and hid her body in a storeroom within the cellar. He'd gone to some extreme lengths to hide the body, placing her beneath the foundations of the home and access to the spot was concealed by a false partition wall. The particular part of the cellar that Sarah was concealed in was never used by Mary Golder, so Newton assumed that she would remain undetected here. But within just a couple of days, Mary began to notice some strange incidents linked to the cellar. Firstly, she found three bloody fingerprints on the clear door, which Newton explained away as being from him stubbing his toe. Hmm, yeah, I don't quite get that one either. But Mary accepted the explanation. But then she also found that a filing cabinet in the cellar had been moved, but again she thought little of it initially. By late October though, Mary noted a horribly pungent smell and an increase in flies in the property. By December she'd had enough and made provisions to move out. But as the pair began to clear the cellar of her things, Kevin Newton would not allow her near the storeroom part of the cellar, instead insisting that he would return himself in the new year to clear that part. The breakthrough came a full five months later, when police were tipped off from Mary Golder and they smashed through the wooden partition that Newton had built to conceal the body and here they found the decomposing body of the 33-year-old. She was gagged with a St George's flag and wrapped in a bedsheet with a bag covering her head. It would be remiss not to feel compassion here for Sarah Mornian's family. Despite the horrendous actions of her brother Andrew, their parents would clearly have endured unparalleled grief 
by first seeing her son sent to prison for murder and shortly after this, their daughter simply vanishing for five worrying months before eventually being discovered murdered. In September 2008, Newton was put on trial for Sarah's murder where he initially pleaded not guilty. However, at the last moment, in the face of irrefutable evidence, he changed his plea. On the day of sentencing, the public gallery at Leeds Crown Court was filled with Sarah's family and friends. The tragic irony was lost on nobody, that the Mornian family were once more in the Crown Court, the very building where a year previously they had watched as their son Andrew was sent to prison for the murder of a young woman. Now they were on the other side to witness justice being served for their daughter Sarah. Kevin Newton was sentenced to 15 years and two months, with the judge explaining that this would only be the minimum term and that Newton would not be released until the parole board deemed him no longer a risk to society. And so with these two cases involving the same family, we can see some of the difficulties bound up in the justice system. Many believe that the government was simply handing a quite literal get-out-of-jail card free to many prisoners, like Andrew Mornian, who should never have had this opportunity. Indeed, the scheme, much like the prisoners' sentences, was ended early in 2010 and was ultimately considered an unsuccessful attempt in addressing the overcrowding prison populations. Undoubtedly, the balancing act is a difficult thing to address but the overriding rhetoric to emerge from the scheme was that sentences should fit the crime, not this week's prison capacity. With this in mind, it must be of little wonder that Amanda Murphy's family feel particularly wronged. It was claimed that only 1% of those who were released early committed another offence upon their release, but for the family and friends of Amanda Murphy, this could never be of any consolation. So what do you make of what we've heard today? Sadly, to many of us, it's depressingly familiar. A vulnerable woman violently attacked and killed by an abusive partner. Just what is going to change to stop this happening and when? It can't just carry on like this, can it? With all these innocent people killed and families destroyed. We've also touched on the theme of prison as a punishment. I appreciate we have very differing views on this and the issues are for a podcast other than this but to me it's relatively simple people who are going to hurt you me and our families go to prison others are dealt with in other ways this means less people are in prison and we can spend more time with those people to help them where possible and accurately assess them to see if they're fit for release and with the news today that dominic rab is the new justice secretary in the uk i'm filled with hope for reform aren't you (laughs) no me neither Finally, our thoughts are with Amanda's family and friends and the family of Sarah Mornian. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast today. To discuss this story, please head to the Facebook group and support the show with the sort of bonus content and benefits you can only dream of in your wildest dreams. Then head to patreon.com slash a UK true crime, the place where all your dreams come true. Reckon that logo could run? Hmm. Me neither. Anyway, on that creative marketing bombshell, it's time for me to leave the building Elvis style. So until we speak again on Tuesday next week, please do take it easy and most of all, stay classy. Streaming only on Peacock. John Wayne Gacy is suspected of having killed as many as 32. Straight from the killer's mouth. They want you to believe that I alone committed these murders. The new gripping six-part documentary series that investigates the crimes that shocked the nation. The thing everybody thought they knew wasn't the whole story. John Wayne Gacy, Devil in Disguise. All episodes streaming now. Devil in Disguise. Only on Peacock. Streaming only on Peacock. She was this moneyed, social girl. Ghislaine Maxwell had it all until she met Jeffrey Epstein. Maxwell helped connect him to the wealthy and famous. Then it all came crashing down. Ghislaine Maxwell's charged with enticement of minors, sex trafficking of children, and perjury. Now a new three-part documentary reveals her story. How on earth could she have got to this place? Epstein's Shadow, Ghislaine Maxwell. Streaming now, only on Peacock.